Good morning again, everybody. We're so excited that you're here. Uh, on behalf of the Women's Fund, I want to thank all of you for being with us on this Saturday morning. This is just the latest doc talk that the Women's Fund is bringing to the Houston community. Uh, if you've been to other doc talks, they really range in such a variety, but all topics that affect our community and especially the women in our community. So we've got a really great agenda today, lots of great insights, two wonderful experts for you that are going to be able to answer so many questions. But most of all, I'm so thrilled that all of you are here today. I know it's hard to find the time, uh, even more so on a weekend when everybody's trying to try to pack it all in. So for those of you new to the Women's Fund, I want to share a little bit about the Women's Fund's mission. And that's to provide Houston area girls and women with the tools that they need to be advocates for their own health. Our health education classes at the Women's Fund, they're unique uh, because they include preventative curriculum. And they also teach resiliency skills and then they relate those skills to your current health risks. So for all of us, we know that the past year or so has really been um, a test in our flexibility, uh, kind of a adapting to different things. And in many ways, um, this uh, new year as we're kind of going into it is bringing more of the same, although I think a lot of us were hoping it would be very different. And a lot of that uncertainty for many of you, and I know this is the case in my own circle as well, surrounds the COVID vaccine. You know, whether you're trying to figure out how to get it, trying to figure out whether to take it, so many questions about which one is the best one, uh, who should be getting it if there's a, if there's a method, so, so to speak. If you've got any of these questions, you are definitely in the right place for us today. I want to introduce myself to you guys, those of you that I don't know already. I'm Casey Curry, and I know a lot of you might know me as a meteorologist here in Houston. I worked on television for a long time here in Houston, and now I've transitioned into the world of community outreach and corporate citizenship. I work for a firm called Alliant Group, and everything we do at Alliant Group is really based in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, which is such a passion of mine as a meteorologist. And um, I'm always so uh, blessed to be able to be with the Women's Fund because I, I so much believe in and support the mission uh, to help women and girls become advocates for their own health through that knowledge. So I want to remind everybody that today we're going to have a discussion. Um, first, we're going to start with a bit of a presentation from both of our presenters, our experts, and then we're going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. If you think of questions throughout the presentations, go ahead and type them in the chat, and then when we get to the end, I'll make sure to call on you. If you don't want to be called on, that's okay. I'm, you know, I'm more than happy to read your question out loud. Uh, but if you want to chat, that's okay too. So we'll save those for the end. I think everybody here is muted. If you haven't muted yourself, go ahead and do it. You know, always a good idea on these kinds of meetings. Um, next, I want to introduce our amazing guests today, our, our experts. So we have Dr. Frene Lacour Chestnut and Dr. Bhavna Lal. Dr. LaCour Chestnut is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences for the U University of Houston College of Medicine. She's a primary care physician and a clinician educator with a focus in internal medicine and pediatrics. LaCour Chestnut is passionate about providing primary care to underserved urban communities, encouraging trainees to pursue careers in primary care, and partnering with community organizations to provide health education to the public. Dr. Bob Nahal Lal is a clinic a clinical assistant professor of adult medicine in the Department of Clinical Sciences at the University of Houston College of Medicine. She's an internal medicine physician with a diverse background in public health, medicine, and public administration. Dr. Lal has a strong interest in bridging gaps between public health and medicine, access to care issues, and addressing public health challenges. I can't think of two better experts to be with us today. And I understand you guys work together a lot in kind of this, this space to share knowledge. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we're gonna get ready to dispel some of the myths out there, answer your questions about the vaccines and learn the evidence-based facts. And I hope that a lot of your questions today uh, turn into answers. You know, you'll be able to not only have the answers for yourself, but share that knowledge with the people in your life. So I welcome uh, Dr. LaCour Chestnut and Dr. Lal, and I'll let you guys take it away. All right, great. It's great to be here with you guys. And I believe Dr. Lal is gonna share her screen with us to start off the presentation. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you all. Um, I can't actually share this screen. It's not allowing me to. I can try to share. Okay, got it. Got it. 
Can you all see my screen? Not yet. No? Now we can see it. Okay, All right, great. perfect. Okay, uh, thank you so much for, oh, go ahead. <laughs> thank you guys for being here. Um, we do wanna mention that this webinar and information that we'll present today um, is not considered medical advice that we are giving out information, but um, you should speak with your own medical providers concerning your own individual um, risk concerns and medical conditions outside of the general information that's presented here today. So as we all know, um, next slide, Dr. Law. As we all know, um, COVID-19 in the United States and globally has impacted us um, pretty severely. In the United States alone, we've had over 500,000 deaths, but across the globe, there's been more than 2.5 million. Um, as we continue to look on the next slide at the status of COVID-19 specifically, next slide, Dr. Law. They're not turning there. Right. Specifically yeah. in Texas, we have had um, more than 2 million cases that have been confirmed. And on the next slide, you'll see that many of those um, fatalities are concentrated around the major uh, metropolitan areas in Texas. And we've had over 40, almost 45,000 um, fatalities from this disease over the past year that we've encountered it. So it's been a rough year for all of us. If you go to the next slide. And we know that um, obviously COVID-19, we have not developed a magic cure or a pill. Yes, we know that there are some treatments that are available to help um, patients when they contract this illness, but prevention is best, right? We want to prevent our family members and friends from developing this potential um, deadly infection, or even if it's not deadly, um, if it is uh, impacting our communities, we want to be able to prevent that so that we don't incur any more loss or um, morbidity or mortality from this infection. All right, next slide. So in addition to speaking about um, vaccines, which Dr. Law will continue with on the next slide, we just wanna remember that there are um, additional public health measures that help us to prevent COVID-19 infection. And that includes remembering the three Ws. So wearing your mask, washing your hands and watching your distance. Um, these things continue to help us to prevent the spread of COVID-19 infection um, in addition to um, becoming vaccinated. All right. So Take it thank, away. thank you so much, Dr. Lakur Chestnut. Um, and thank you to the Women's Fund for having us. It's great to talk about COVID 19 vaccines given the importance of um, the status of all of this right now. So I'm going to speak about the COVID 19 vaccination, um, including the three vaccines that are currently out for emergency use authorization, starting um, with just an overview of SARS-CoV-2. So, so I'm sure you all have seen this so many times, it's probably been ingrained in your heads by the, <laughs> over the last year. This is the virus that has caused so much devastation throughout the world. If you look at this, I'm gonna um, have you focus just on these little, these little red triangles. These are little spike proteins. So um, we're gonna talk a lot about that specifically and um, just keep this image in your mind, okay? Hard time moving the slides. Okay. So the COVID-19 vaccines current um, and potential use in the US. Right now, we have several that are approved in, in America. Um, the three approved are the two mRNA vaccines and the one viral vector vaccine, which is a Johnson & Johnson. The two mRNA vaccines are the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. There are some that are still under review right now and are in clinical trials, which I'll talk about. So the three that I'm gonna speak about specifically are the mRNA vaccine, the viral vector vaccines, and the protein subunit vaccines. The COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. So as you know, the COVID-19 vaccines are free in the US. The Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines have been deemed safe and effective by both the Food and Drug Administration and Centers for Disease Control. And both mRNA vaccines began phase three trials in the US in July. So this has been with record speed, but they have gone through all the same steps that you would if, if there was any other vaccination program. 
um, and any other clinical trial. There's been no difference except that they've just received a significant amount of funding and have really worked hard to get these vaccines out. So the two available mRNA COVID-19 vaccines um, for the mRNA are the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, which is eligible for people over age 16. It's given in two dose series, 21 days apart, ideally. And the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, which is eligible for people, eligible for people over age 18, given two dose series, 28 days apart. And the reason this is eligible for over age 16 or over age 18 is just because they haven't actually studied the younger populations and they are in the process of studying younger populations. So hopefully we'll have more information for pediat for the um, children um, and teenagers soon. So the current mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is 95% effective after two dose series based on the initial studies. The vaccine efficacy between the first and second dose of the vaccine was 52% per initial data that was submitted to the FDA. It could be more as well. Uh, the Moderna is 94.1% effective after two dose. Sorry. Um, and the vaccine efficacy can provide 80.2% efficacy after first dose per initial data submitted to the FDA. So you'll see a lot of these numbers um, over the last couple of weeks to months. And this is basically what it's showing is both of them are efficacious. And um, there's been a lot of debate over giving first dose versus giving both doses. You should take both doses of the vaccine. It's very important to take both doses. So the mRNA vaccines teach our cells how to make a protein or the piece of the protein. If you go back to that, remember that first slide with those, um, the red, the triangles, those are the spike protein, and that's what it's making. So the mRNA tech vaccine technologies has been studied for more than a decade on flu, Zika virus, rabies, and cytomegalovirus, just as examples. Once that injection goes into your arm, it triggers an immune response. This immune response produces antibodies, and this, these antibodies provide us protection if we're exposed to the real virus. Many people have reported mild to moderate effects, side effects within the first few days of the vaccine. Local side effects include injection site pain, redness, or swelling in the upper arm. And systemic side effects are fatigue, fevers, chills, muscle aches, headaches. And these usually resolve within one to three days. Um, it could last and some people document it within the first seven days, but for most people, they've been uh, within three days, these are usually gone. And most common um, systemic side effects are occurring after the second dose and in younger ages. So you're not, the elderly have actually been spared for the most part with significant side effects, which is good. So they're, um, they're not complaining as much of these strong immune responses, which given um, age, they wouldn't have as much necessarily of a robust immune response. So having these side effects is actually a good thing. You want to have a little bit of something, a sore arm, a fever, a chill is actually a good response. Um, you don't necessarily have to have these responses. And a lot of people have said, oh, well, I didn't have anything. Does it, is it still okay? It's still okay. It's just that some people's bodies have um, stronger immune responses. So Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccine contraindications, meaning when you should not take it. So if you've had a severe allergic reaction after a previous dose of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components, or if you've had an immediate allergic reaction of any severity to any of the, of the, pri the, the prior COVID-19 vaccine or any of its components, which includes something called polyethylene glycol, which is also, um, it's also a laxative, a Miralax um, is an example of polyethylene glycol. And it's also an immediate allergic reaction to any severity to polysorbate, which could be poly potential class reactivity to polyethylene glycol. These are contraindications, but regardless, even if you've had these issues come up with these allergies, you can still take the vaccine if you've been evaluated by an allergist or immunologist to determine if you can safely receive the vaccine with an advanced medical care setting nearby or under observation. So if you, if you have this allergic component, um, to one of these ingredients of the vaccine and you still wanna take it, you could speak to an allergist or immunologist. You can be, have it in a hospital care setting and you can possibly get pre-medicated as well. It depends on um, which allergist or immunologist you're talking to, but there have been situations where people have still been taking this. So anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis means severe allergic reaction. So the Pfizer Moderna vaccines have actually done pretty well based on data until January 18th from what's called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System in the US. 
the anaphylaxis following these vaccinations is actually a rare event. Only 4.7 cases per million doses administered um, with Pfizer and 2.5 cases per million administered Moderna vaccine doses have we seen uh, an event, which is pretty good. Um, for the most part, people have done really well. Asymptomatic spread. So all of you, I'm sure, have heard about, does this reduce asymptomatic spread? Meaning that when I get the vaccine, can I still spread this to others? Why do I have to wear a mask after I get the vaccine? Because we don't exactly know if we can still spread this um, virus without having any symptoms after we get the vaccine. But we actually have pretty good data now. Um, Moderna, when they submitted an addendum to the FDA, they actually did a study with nasal swab data showing that 14 of 14,134 people who got its vaccine had an asymptomatic case of COVID compared to 38 of the 14,073 in the control group. So it did reduce asymptomatic spread, meaning people who got the vaccine did not necessarily spread the virus without realizing, without having any symptoms. Um, according to a pre-published paper, has it not been peer-reviewed from Israel, from the Israel Health Ministry and Pfizer, it found that Pfizer vaccine appeared to reduce asymptomatic infections, meaning infections without any symptoms by 89.4% and symptomatic infections by 93.7%. So given these are both mRNA vaccines, this is, um, this is, pretty, this is great data showing that we, we have a chance of this actually reducing transmission as well. But it's still important to wear a mask after you get the vaccine, given we don't know the exact data for how much we can still spread this. So the Johnson & Johnson Janssen viral vector vaccine. I'm sure you all have heard a lot about this in the last couple of days and seen all the news prints on this and, and the news media. So it's the single intramuscular injection. So same concept. It goes into your arm, into the muscle, and um, it's been deemed safe and effective by the FDA and CDC for emergency use authorization. It's approved for age 18 and over. Um, the clinical trial involved 44,000 people conducted in eight, uh, eight countries, three continents, and 34% were over the age of 60. The benefit of this, it can be stored in a refrigerator for up to three months, um, two to eight degrees Celsius. The, as you know, with the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, there's been a lot of debate over this because the Pfizer vaccine needs ultra cold storage at minus 20 Celsius, um, but it can actually be put in a fridge now for up to five days. And the Moderna vaccine can be put in a fridge for up to 30 days. So that has, um, that has helped the situation. But the Johnson Johnson could be really a game changer. We could store this in a refrigerator for up to three months and it can remain stable in for two years at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Plus it's only one dose. The viral vector COVID-19 vaccines include the J&J &J and the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. So this is still under trial, the AstraZeneca and Oxford vaccine. We don't have it approved in America, but it's been approved throughout the world. Um, so the concept behind this is that we have this vector, which is basically this, it's a kind of like a machine, you could say, will enter a cell and use the cell's machinery to produce this spike protein, that those red spots that we saw at the first slide or on the bottom here as well which is found on the surface of the virus of COVID-19. Again, none of these viruses, none of these um, vaccines I've talked about have any live virus. They basically write a, a message. Um, the cells display spike protein on its surface. And after the um, vector in the Johnson Johnson vaccine produces this uh, spike protein, and then the immu our immune system responds by producing again antibodies after not being able to recognize the spike protein as its own. So, you get this injection, it produces a spike protein, and then your immune system responds by making antibodies. And that's the next time you get exposed to this virus, you'll have antibodies. So the efficacy, um, this has unfortunately caused some negativity in the media over the last couple of days, which is not good. So I'm just gonna clear this up here. It, Johnson, Johnson Johnson, what you want to do with COVID is to prevent hospitalizations and deaths. That is key. You want to prevent deaths and hospitalizations. Johnson Johnson has been shown to have 85% overall efficacy against severe disease across the countries and ages, all the countries that they were studied. South Africa had only 57% efficacy because um, the Johnson Johnson has been, Johnson Johnson vaccine has been studied during a time when all these variants of the COVID-19 vaccine have been you know, rampant. The Brazil variant, the South Africa variant, the UK variant, 
these variants are more transmissible. And um, when Moderna and Pfizer were being studied, they were not there. Um, they were not as prevalent. So South Africa only had 57% efficacy because 90% of the COVID in South Africa was caused by the South Africa variant. In Brazil, it was 66% effective. And in the US, we had 72% efficacy against moderate to severe COVID four weeks after injection, which is great. We really only need 60% um, for the world, for a vaccine to actually get herd immunity. So the seeds are great, 85% is excellent. Johnson Johnson efficacy in the US is again, um, sorry, um, one second. Hold on a second, okay. So, um, okay, so Johnson Johnson, 72% F efficacy against moderate to severe COVID-19 after injection, 66% overall effective in clinical trial at preventing lab, uh, lab resulted COVID-19 illness two weeks after receiving the vaccine. No hospitalizations were noted in the study in those who got the vaccine um, four weeks after receiving it. And it may provide protection against asymptomatic infection um, based on some early evidence. Side effects are similar to other COVID-19 vaccines. Most occurred within one to two days following vaccination and were mild to moderate in severity lasting one to two days. Local injection site reaction was common, uh, pain, redness of the skin or swelling, fatigue, headache, muscle, joint pain, nausea, fever, chills were also noted and no anaphylaxis cases thus far, which is good. Um, anaphylaxis again is severe allergic reactions. Contraindications if you have had a severe allergic reaction to an immediate or an immediate allergic reaction to an ingredient of the Johnson Johnson vaccine, such as polysorbate, you should not receive the vaccine unless you speak to your allergist, immunologist, et cetera. And you can see all the ingredients on the CDC webpage. Um, they actually have a link to the ingredients. So if you, if you go under CDC and um, Johnson Johnson, you'll be able to find this information. So COVID-19 vaccines, the duration of vaccine-induced immunity is not known currently. It's unknown when we'll need a booster of the vaccine as of now, but Moderna, Pfizer are actually all working on the booster vaccine. They're actually trialing it as well. And the Johnson Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, they say will be um, easily adaptable to the variants that are currently circulating as well. The variants, just to touch on this. So the original G variant, um, D614G, it's also called G, was discovered in China in January 2020. It spread to New York and Europe soon after. Um, more transmissible likely than the original strain. The variant had four to five times more spikes, those red spots on the, that I showed you at the beginning on its surface, allowing to latch onto and infect cells. And hence we were, um, we had a huge spike in cases after Europe did in March. So the G variant was studied by Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. It showed 94.1% and 95% effectiveness in trials, as I mentioned um, before. The new variants, so you've seen a lot of coverage on this on the news as well. And um, just to make this clear, the Brazil variant, um, it, these are some variants that are, are uh, spreading. So Brazil variant is a P1 variant. It was reported in Brazil and more than 24 other countries. Um, and we're actually seeing this in the US as well in five US states reporting, probably more soon. Um, the UK variant is reported in the UK and greater than 70 other countries now. And 33 US states are reporting and this will probably be the most transmissible virus variant that we have within a couple of weeks, spreading um, very fast and doubling every 10 days. So the South Africa variant is the one I talked to about earlier. It's the B1351 variant is in South Africa and in greater than 40 other countries now. The Denmark variant is in Northern California and in 12 other states. The New York variant has also been spotted, a B1526. And the California variant is Cal20C, um, which carries these specific mutations that might also increase transmissibility. Houston, Texas has all major variants of concern. We're actually the first city to have all of them. So we have the Brazil variant, the South Africa variant, the UK variant, the California variant, and the New York variant. So it's so important to wear a mask and social distance, especially if you've not gotten the vaccine and get vaccinated. There's an urgency to vaccinate given all these variants circulated, circulating. There's an urgent need to vaccinate populations who are elderly and medically vulnerable, especially in populations and minority communities hardest hit by the pandemic. And the Moderna and Pfizer and um, Johnson Johnson and other companies are researching the vaccine and are discussing variants and testing booster vaccines as I discussed to test all these variants. And Johnson Johnson also says that he, they can adapt to the, their vaccine to the new variants. So why did I take the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, this is me getting my second dose. 
I took the COVID-19 vaccine for my community, family, friends, and patients. With every person vaccinated, which is now 16.7% of America has received one dose, and 8.6% are fully vaccinated, under 10% in um, Texas still, but hopefully we will improve. And um, I hope that with the vaccinations, we come closer to seeing the end of this awful pandemic. And by getting vaccinated, each one of us is helping humanity overcome the devastation from this virus. This is really our shot to end this pandemic and bring our lives back to normal. And as you can see, there's some Tylenol sitting in that picture as well. Um, after the, I would not take any Tylenol or ibuprofen before the vaccination. So I would not pre-medicate. But after the vaccine, once you start seeing some symptoms, if you want to take Tylenol, it's completely fine to do that and drink lots of fluids as well. Okay, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Lakur Chestnut. Thank you. Dr. Lal, do you want to just continue sharing since you're already there? And I'll just yes. have you, ask you to okay. advance the slides. It's just easier. Yeah. Um, thank you for doing that. So we'll just um, talk a, a little bit about some of the myths that are circulating on the internet and in some of our circles with our friends or family members and give you some of the real deal about um, uh, the truth about some of these myths, okay? The first one is that the COVID-19 vaccine is not safe because it was developed too quickly. They rushed this thing through and I shouldn't take it. Well, that is not true. Actually, yes, vaccines typically take a long time to develop. One, because you don't have a lot of funding in vaccines. Vaccines aren't fancy medications that cost a lot of money um, and they are in prevention. So instead of having just one scientist whose lab is working at this one particular pharmaceutical company on this one particular vaccine, which normally, if you don't have a lot of funding, that's gonna take a really long time. Basically, it was all hands on deck. We have all of our different pharmaceutical companies. We have um, funding that came in from various resources. And then you stopped a lot of other projects and said, this is the, you know, all hands on deck, we're working on this together in order to um, develop this. So what normally because of funding and uh, resources in terms of personnel would normally take many years only took a shorter amount of time. The technology was already there. So the technology to develop the mRNA vaccine was already there and had been investigated for um, several years and tried like Dr. Uh, Law mentioned, informing Zika, Ebola, and other vaccines. So this is not just a rush job. This is technology and science that was already available and we just put all of our resources in one spot. The second myth is that there are severe side effects to the COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. Lal already mentioned the majority of side effects that people have are mild and transient, meaning they last one to three days, they're short term, um, most people get a local reaction, and then some people have um, those systemic side effects that we talked about, headache, fatigue, um, maybe feeling a little bit of nausea, uh, for a couple of days. And I always like to mention that there are people who develop COVID-19 um, infection who go on to have some of those same symptoms for weeks, months at a time. And uh, we know that there are people after they've had COVID-19 infection who are what we call long haulers who have had continued headache, fatigue and symptoms for several months. And so if you can withstand this for just one to three days, it's worth it. Um, so that you don't have to deal with those potential effects of having long hauler after you develop COVID-19 true infection. All right, next slide, Dr. Long. Um, the next myth is that if you've already had COVID-19 infection and recovered that you don't need a vaccine. Well, that is untrue. As we see these variants that, are, um, that have developed, the virus, viruses mutate. That's normal, we know that that's going to happen. Scientists from the um, many, many years have seen that viruses mutate. And so there are variants that are new that are coming out. So you definitely want to be able to um, get a vaccine if you have the opportunity, even if you've already had COVID-19 infection, it could protect you from potentially getting a different variant than what you had before. I will mention that there are recommendations that if you were treated with a monoclonal antibody um, for COVID-19 infection that you don't get the vaccine right away. 
that you would should wait um, approximately 90 days or three months after you've had the monoclonal antibody in order to get the vaccine or wait that time. But you should speak with your physician about that. The reason is, is you don't want your immune system to have a um, lower or blunted response um, to the vaccine whenever you receive it because you already have these antibodies that are circulating in your body. Um, all right, next thing, you won't need to wear a mask after you get your um, COVID-19 vaccine. Well, that's definitely untrue again because of the variants. There are some scenarios where if you and everyone in your household um, or other members of your community that are in your COVID bubble um, have also been vaccinated that you might feel slightly comfortable um, taking your mask off around them. But when you are in public around people who you do not know or people who are not in your bubble, it's important to make sure that you're still masking to prevent being infected with those variants like we talked about. And we also don't know, like Dr. Law mentioned, about asymptomatic transmission. So it's possible that for me, children that live in my house obviously have not been vaccinated. They're both under 16. So I wouldn't want to um, have anyone else to come into our household unmasked because they've had their vaccine and then potentially be an asymptomatic um, carrier and then transmit it to them or transmit it to anyone else. So that's just an example of reasons why we should continue with mask wearing and distancing ourselves from people who we don't necessarily um, come in contact after we've been vaccinated. All right, next slide. Um, so some people, um, Dr. Law mentioned anaphylaxis as a reason to be cautious and consult with a physician um, before getting the COVID any of the COVID-19 vaccines. But specifically, there's a myth that if you're allergic to eggs that you shouldn't get the COVID-19 vaccine. This allergy to eggs comes into play with the influenza vaccine. It does not come into play with COVID-19 vaccines. None of the ones that are um, approved for emergency use authorization contain eggs or any egg products. So if you have an allergy to eggs, you are free and clear to get the vaccine with the caveat that if you've had a severe allergic reaction, again, in terms of anaphylaxis, that means your throat closes up, your lips swell, your tongue swell, you have difficulty breathing, that you are encouraged to speak with your allergist and you should remain for observation for at least 30 minutes mm -hmm. after you've had the vaccine. Um, there's another myth floating around that mRNA vaccines can alter your DNA. Um, that is not true. So um, I'm sure uh, Casey remembers, um, since she's a scientist, remember that cell and where the nucleus is located. So the nucleus is um, a part of the cell that contains the DNA and it has a little like wall around it, kind of like a fortress. mRNA doesn't breach that fortress um, ever in the cell. So there's no way for this mRNA vaccine to get into that nucleus and change that DNA. So our cells are pretty smart in the science. Um, we just don't, the mRNA doesn't have the ability. It lives in the cytoplasm in the outside of um, where the nucleus is. So it will not alter your DNA. All right, next slide. Um, this one actually has gained some steam with the Johnson and Johnson um, vaccine coming out in the in the past week. So the myth that COVID-19 vaccines were developed using fetal tissue, that is not true. So Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer, Moderna, none of them contain fetal cells or were used in the development or production of the vaccine. Um, Again, there initially was some concern about the ultra cold storage that was needed for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, and people thought that, oh, they must have lots of preservatives. That's why they have to be kept at super low temperatures. Actually, it's the opposite. Um, you put a lot of preservatives and things that you want them to be on the shelf at room temperature. Think of like your canned you know, vegetables. So you can them and do things to keep them um, at room temperature. But if it's super low, think of it like your flash frozen uh, vegetables that go in your freezer. There's not additional typically preservatives. The preserved element is the frozen nature. So messenger RNA or mRNA is very fragile. And so basically it's very sensitive to heat, 
and temperatures. So you want to keep it cold so that that mRNA, when it goes into making that um, spike protein, will be actually active. Um, so there's no extra preservatives that are in the vaccine and actually the cold is what is preserving the vaccine. Next slide. Alrighty, and we're kind of down to our, I believe these are our last two myths and facts that we have to share. The first one um, is that COVID-19 vaccines can cause infertility or miscarriage. And this is a big concern that we've seen with women um, and also with mothers who are thinking about um, either having children soon or what should they do for their children about getting a vaccine. And there's no evidence that COVID-19 vaccination has been linked to infertility or miscarriage. Um, obviously, there haven't been any studies targeted at looking at infertility or miscarriage. All of the studies were looking at whether or not we can um, basically prevent severe COVID infection and prevent deaths. So this was not the end target of the studies, but we have seen that during natural infection, which is what your body mimics whenever you get a vaccine, is that the immune system generates the same antibodies to the spike protein that the COVID-19 vaccines would. And to this point, we have not seen any increases in infertility or miscarriage in women. Um, in some of the newer, the original studies did not include women who were pregnant, um, but there were some people who inadvertently became pregnant or did not know they were pregnant. And those women have um, not had any increase in their adverse effects, including no increase in infertility or miscarriage in that population. Um, I'll talk a little bit too, maybe in our question and answer about what the American College of Gynecology and Obstetrics says to do for women who are pregnant, who want to become pregnant, um, and who are breastfeeding. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, last but not least is that the COVID-19 vaccine was developed as a way to like put in a microchip or to control the population or track us. And that is not the case. Um, there is no vaccine microchip. There's nothing that's going to track you or gather your personal information or anything like that into a database. This particular myth um, was kind of spread after Bill Gates mentioned um, that we should try to develop some kind of way to have a national vaccine registry that's electronic. Um, and when we think of that as health professionals, we think electronic medical record, that there would be a way to share across states um, that this person did get their COVID-19 vaccine in Texas, but now they live in Rhode Island. And so you wouldn't have to carry that paper card with you, you know, around to say that, the, yes, I did get vaccinated, that there would be some way electronically to track that nothing to do with a microchip tracking us in the vaccine. All right, next slide, Dr. Law. Um, so some of the question marks, things that we don't know yet. The, um, how long will immunity last? We don't know. Why don't we know? Because we are all in this together. We just all started encountering this particular um, virus and strain and pandemic together. And so as we continue to see how the initial studies from people who um, initially took the first set of vaccines in July of 20, uh, 2020, we'll continue to see how they do. How long does this uh, immunity from vaccination last? Um, so we're in it together. We don't know what the long, long-term effects are, but coming up in July, we'll have at least a year's worth of data from those initial studies. Uh, we also don't know, as Dr. Law mentioned, how well will vaccination work against some of the new strains and variants. Um, time will tell. There are studies that are being done um, that will help give us a little bit more insight on some of those. A lot of them are what we call in vitro studies, so in the lab, not necessarily in people, um, to help us determine how well vaccination is going to work against those new strains. So we are here to see. At least we know that um, and we have a little bit of that data that Dr. Law mentioned about asymptomatic spread, but it hasn't been published yet. So those are also questions. Can vaccination truly help prevent asymptomatic spread? That will also be important with our pediatrics patients, and we can answer some questions and talk a little bit about that as well. All right. Next slide, Dr. Law. I think that's it. So this is a picture of myself and many of our colleagues over at University of Houston College of Medicine who are... Um, 
many of them who are also actually uh, volunteering at a vaccination clinic today um, in efforts to educate our community as well as provide this much needed service to help our uh, family, friends, and widespread community to um, get over this pandemic and prevent morbidity and mortality, so sickness and death. So we appreciate um, uh, being able to present today to you guys and are open and welcome to any questions that you have. So thank you so much, Drs. LaCour, Chestnut, and Dr. Lal. Uh, I wanna encourage everybody to uh, type your question in the chat and then I'm happy to call on you if you want to ask it of the doctors. Um, while you guys are thinking of your questions, I was furiously writing down mine as I was listening. I learned a lot today, but I still have some questions. I, I came in with kind of going in and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, one of the ongoing discussions I've had with my girlfriends of color, especially, is this general mistrust of the government that we've talked about um, kind of socially, I feel like for the last year anyway. And that's led over into discussions of the vaccine. And a lot of my, my girlfriends are saying, I may still get the vaccine, but I'm really nervous about getting it because I don't trust the government. A lot of them cite previous historical events, Tuskegee, syphilis study, all of these things. Do you guys have thoughts on um, maybe how to address that? Absolutely. Um, historically, in communities of color, in the Black community, there have been um, mistrust based on um, some historical or many historical things that have happened. Um, and I'd like to say that that mistrust is justifiable, um, meaning that you are worried. And so that is why we're here as, you know, physicians to say and to look at the science and to um, encourage them that many things that were done in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even potentially um, were hidden. There were many rules that um, were put into place since then to ensure that there is transparency um, in science and in clinical trials and studies that was not in place back then. There were um, indications that um, Black people were not necessarily considered um, equal as participants, were not given the ability to understand and consent to some of the things that were done. And so it is important to acknowledge the historical um, mistrust that is there. And for uh, all scientists, physicians, medical professionals now to be able to say, we know and understand why that is the case. And here's the transparent information that we have now and why it's important for our communities to be vaccinated. So I do like to speak specifically to, to people who have concerns and address those concerns. Um, many of them, um, if you ask specific questions like, what is it that's worrying you about this vaccine? And some people did not trust, um, trust the government. And now that um, our president, or the presidency has changed hands, it's like, well, do you trust more now or do you not? And really what is the, what is the question? And many of, much of it comes down to historical aspects um, that I think if, one of the most important things is if you have a relationship with a trusted health professional, a physician, um, primary care provider, nurse practitioner, whoever cares for you, having that discussion and that trusting relationship will definitely make an impact for people who have mistrust um, uh, about vaccines or any other medical issues. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree. I, I think that um, for me, it, I, well, I think for the country, um, we should also think about, remember the first group that actually went first was the healthcare workers. And I, I think it was actually really helpful that the nurse practitioners and nurses and the physicians went first because we, we were, we tried it first, you know, we have the information with us to actually say we took it, we, um, it's, we did fine and we endorse it. So I think it was actually really helpful that all of us took it at the beginning and um, I know that there's been a lot of uh, issues of mistrust over the past year with government. However, this has been, this has gone through a rigorous clinical trial process with um, different agencies and also a huge group of physicians and scientists. And it's actually been, um, has actually been researched worldwide now. 
So they're really, I know there's a, there is that issue of mistrust, but this is, um, it's a worldwide effort. And I actually, for me, I think um, knowing that one of my attendings from residency um, at Yale was actually the head of, he's a director for Center for Biologics and Evaluation at FDA, Dr. Peter Marks. He's actually one of the people that actually approves this, these vaccines. So he was one of the final says. And, and we said, you know, as a group, um, my colleagues from residency was like, if Dr. Marks approves this and feels that we should all get it, then we need to get it. So I think that um, it really is important to have that trusted member to say, this is fine, this is safe, it's effective. And I, I do believe in these vaccines. I think the only way out of this pandemic is going to be these vaccines. And I really like to see the people that are most vulnerable, who are most affected actually get vaccinated because I think that's been our um, biggest shortcoming right now is that we're not getting to the populations that actually need it. And if we don't get to those populations, then um, those people will still die. And that's not, we can't have that ha continue to happen. And I would like to mention just from a public health standpoint, I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Law, that the vaccine needs to get to communities um, and people who might not be tech savvy that they can jump on different websites um, and try to maneuver as the um, way has been here in, in Texas is what website can you get on fast enough um, to get and schedule an appointment um, or who might not have an email address or who might not have a cell phone with text features, um, some of our elderly patients, et cetera. The great thing about having another vaccine such as Johnson & Johnson is, can we now have public health efforts that can go into communities house to house because it is um, able to be refrigerated. You can have that cooling device that you could take into neighborhoods that have been impacted and hit very hard and that trusted hopefully trusted healthcare professional that might look like or have a connection to that community would be able to deliver that vaccine in a single dose. Um, so these are some of the benefits of having not only a uh, Pfizer and Moderna that needs ultra cold storage, but also having Johnson & Johnson. There are people who are also hesitant um, to vaccines, scared of needles, other things that they might just want that single dose. And it does provide a good amount of protection and uh, efficacy. So can we jump on that thought too? That was one of my questions uh, as far as getting the vaccine itself. You know, we have tons of people that are qualified to get it. They're in the right category. And I know for myself, I have spent hours getting all the elderly folks in my life and then sharing that information with friends of mine so they can do the same for their parents, their grandparents, their aunts and uncles. Why is it like this? I mean, what, what happened to make this this way and, and how can we move forward in a, in a better way? Because like you said, a lot of the folks who need this are not getting it. Well, what happened initially is that we didn't have a national guidance or approach to how the vaccines should be distributed um, and what was a strategy that was thought about, about the best way to um, do that. Each state does have a differing number of people in different categories. So you look at some states where there are many elderly people, like the, you know, the population is large for those who are 75 and above, who we know have the highest mortality rate if they contract COVID-19. Um, there are other states who have larger um, Hispanic populations and Black populations who we know that have increased risk of um, contracting severe COVID infection. And so each state um, in, in here in Texas as well had a task force that helped to determine how, we, how they would go about rolling out the vaccines. And so here in Texas, initially um, the larger healthcare institutions had the ability to um, basically send in an application and see if you would be approved, if you had the resources to be able to store vaccine and administer and all of those things. Um, and so now I think that after the initial rollout um, and there were hiccups as, as you would expect, 
um, and difficulties with getting the vaccine out, I think there's been more of a push to say this rollout was not as equitable as we wanted it to be. There are communities that are much more have been hardly hit and you can map that by zip code and then you look at vaccinations in that zip code and they're much less. And so we have to have targeted strategies through um, different public health institutions, through other community organizations, through churches that can help us get vaccine to where it's needed most. And so I think that after that initial rollout and seeing some of the numbers of who has been vaccinated and these communities weren't necessarily um, as hardly hit as others that there have been public health strategies that have started to shift that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, and I feel your pain about signing people up for this vaccine. I, um, I literally stayed up nights trying to get vaccines online um, and it was such a challenge. I. I mean, three of my aunts and uncles in Boston got COVID, one hospitalized for seven days, right when the vaccine rolled out, two days before February 1st um, for 75 and over. And I just felt so bad that, you know, that, that we have a vaccine and they had to be hospitalized because they couldn't get it because it wasn't rolled out in Massachusetts on time. And whereas in Texas, we started over 65 and over at the end of December, but still there are over 65 year olds that haven't gotten the vaccine. One of my friends is a physician in Boston and her mother died uh, two weeks ago in Dallas because she didn't get vaccinated. I mean, it's just, it's such a tragedy. I think that this is really, um, when we look back on this process, it's going to really be a sort of case analysis of what happened in every state. And um, it really is the tech savvy people or the younger folks that really help people get vaccinated. So I think some of the more ingenious ways that have been working out well is that um, in, in Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago, because they realized 75 year olds were not getting vaccinated, they started a companion um, ticket, you could say. So anyone that could, um, anyone who signed up a 75 year old could come to the large mass vaccination sites and get their vaccine as well. So that would mean that all these young people, these 19 year old, 20 year olds were actually finding a 75 year old, like find your 75 year old and over, vac register them online, stay up all night, we'll do whatever you need to do, and then take them by ride, figure out a ride for them as well, pick them up, bring them to the site, get vaccinated and get themselves vaccinated. And it actually worked out well because most of the cases are spreading from that 18 to 49 year old age group. So you get the older person vaccinated and the younger person vaccinated, which I think things like that, we have to create innovative ways. Like in uh, Maryland, they're having mobile vans that are doing the, they're using a primary care van to go out and just use that as vaccination sites. I mean, we have to figure out ways to get people these vaccines because um, a tech rollout cannot work for people who don't even know how to use cell phones or, you know, get on the internet at 4 a.m. when CVS releases their vaccines or whatever. So it's- um, I love that. I love hearing about that, actually. Um, I want to remind everybody, we're streaming on YouTube right now. We actually have quite a few questions from our folks that are on YouTube. And then this is all being recorded and will be shared later on the Women's Fund website so that you can share this link with everybody who didn't get a chance to join us today. I want to go to one of those questions that's on, on watching on YouTube right now. And it goes back to uh, Dr. LaCour Chestnut. You were talking about uh, pregnant, wanting to become pregnant women, breastfeeding women. Let's talk a little bit more about that because their specific question has to do with which type of vaccine might be better. But I imagine you guys have all kinds of stuff to say about folks in that category. So the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology did publish a statement that pregnant women are at higher risk for developing severe COVID infection. As we all know, when women are pregnant, our immune system is lower. The reason why is because you're carrying a foreign body, <laughs> literally, <laughs> in your body. So your immune system cannot be as reactive or else you would be more likely to um, uh, have a miscarriage or you know, react to that basically baby that you're cooking. And so um, you are more likely to develop infections. And so despite the studies not largely including um, pregnant women or not enrolling pregnant women, the American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology does recommend that women who are pregnant um, do receive the vaccine. There's no um, difference in terms of they don't recommend one vaccine over the other. Um, in women who, again, were in those studies who developed pregnancy or who became pregnant um, inadvertently while they were in the studies have not had increased risk of miscarriage or any other implications on their unborn um, and then born babies. So uh, we 
would recommend that you speak with your OBGYN physician um, for those who are pregnant, but it is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine and probably one of the best things that you can do, especially if you are hoping to become pregnant soon. That's an important piece. Yeah. So um, Ashley, who's with us right now, um, she has a question. She's an educator. She's had bad reactions to the flu vaccine before but knows that it's important to get the vaccine. Any thoughts, advice for her on how to navigate this? Um, so I would say it depends what your bad reaction is. The majority of people, whenever they get a vaccine, it's usually during um, already flu season, which already has um, other cold viruses that are circulating around. So most people, if they've gotten the flu vaccine and then they're like, you know, a week later I got sick and I think I had the flu, maybe it's just a cold. And so maybe that flu vaccine did not cause those particular um, reactions that you developed. So I would speak with your physician, but the flu vaccine and the technology that's used in the flu vaccine is totally different from the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, actually, the COVID-19 is more deadly than influenza. And so if you are open to taking the flu vaccine, definitely should be open and hopefully wanting to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I would not um, make that connection, you know, between the two vaccines in my mind and would treat them separately, um, depending on the, you know, reaction. Some people who are allergic to eggs or allergic to other parts of the influenza vaccine and have, and have had bad reactions, sometimes think they can't take other types of vaccines, but this one is different. Um, and so I would definitely encourage, um, especially, you know, not because you're an educator, but just because you're a person, but as an educator, if you are required to be around other people and you are not teaching virtually and able to keep your bubble tight, I mean, you are at a, a higher risk because you have more contact with people. So I would encourage you to get it. I would also say that um, most of the reactions happen within the first half an hour after the vaccine. So that's why people are monitored for 15 minutes if they have no history of allergic reactions and 30 minutes if you have a history of severe allergic reactions after the vaccine. And that's standard throughout the country. So if you are concerned about, I'm not sure if this person had an anaphylactic reaction to the flu vaccine, but if there's a history of anaphylaxis, you can be monitored for 30 minutes after the vaccine is given to you. And I would review the ingredients on the CDC website for all three vaccines and make sure you're not allergic to any of those ingredients. And um, I would also make sure that I, if you're concerned, I would take a day off after work, um, after the first vaccine, after the second vaccine, and just rest, drink fluids, take Tylenol as needed after the vaccine. Um, but what, whatever you can do to try to get this, I would try to get it. <laughs> so one of our other questions that came in from YouTube is about folks that are immunocompromised. You are on immunosuppressants because they have an autoimmune disorder. So can we talk about that a little bit? I know that um, their specific question was about if there was a certain vaccine that was better, but so many of us know people that have lupus or, or something else um, and are on immunosuppressants. Talk about that part too. And clearly this is something they discussed with their doctor, but that can play a role in timing of all of this too. Yes, if you are on certain, especially injectable immunosuppressants, you for sure want to speak with your um, physician, whether it's your rheumatologist, your internist, wh whomever is managing that condition for you. Um, but people who are immune suppressed, obviously by nature of that um, disease, whether they're on it, whether they're immune suppressed because they're taking certain medications or if they're immune suppressed because of their medical condition, um, both of those scenarios put you at a higher risk for developing severe COVID infection. Um, and so you definitely need to be vaccinated. Neither one of the types of vaccines, the viral vector or the mRNA, so any of the three that we have out, have been shown to be inferior or superior any of the vaccines that you could get, um, it would be a recommendation to do so. And when, here in um, Harris County or in Texas, uh, there is the ability when you sign up to say other, that you have a condition, you would be 1B. If you are immunosuppressed, just like somebody who has cancer and maybe is on chemotherapy, they are immune suppressed. If you are on immunosuppressive medications or immune suppressed 
you can click that other button and say, I have an immune, you know, autoimmune disease and I take immunosuppressant medication. So there have been people who have asked that question who have, like you mentioned, lupus, who have multiple sclerosis, who have um, other like connective tissue diseases, et cetera. And if you, or who are chronically on steroids for some of those conditions that put you at a higher risk and you would qualify under that 1B designation because you are immune suppressed, but definitely something to talk with your doctor about in terms of timing. Yeah, because Dr. LaCour Chestnut, also if you're on immunosuppressants, in theory, the vaccine may not be as effective, right? I mean, don't you need that immune response? So you can still develop an immune response. Um, I, I think Dr. Law was going to chime in on that one. You can for sure still develop an immune response um, when taking the vaccine. Yeah, so th there's been a lot of questions that I've gotten about this as well. Um, um, the American College of Rheumatology, if you go to their webpage, you actually can see a, a statement by them that actually lists the medications um, that should be stopped before the vaccine or during the vaccine. Um, for example, methotrexate should not be taken that week, should be taken one week after the vaccine or things like that. They actually have a whole list that um, states. But um, I would definitely speak to your rheumatologist or your internist to discuss uh, if you need to stop any medications for a week after or um, before. However, most, um, again, we're learning as we go along and um, the immunosuppressed conditions we don't know how much of an immune response people will have, but we hope that they will have an immune response of any type um, and will give them some protection. So we don't know if someone without a spleen will have as robust of an immune response or someone who has immunosuppressive um, condition will have as robust of a, co a immune response as someone who's younger with a robust immune system, but it's better than not having any protection at all. And it's gonna be studied over the next year, a couple of years, and we'll have more information. But I would really would discuss any immunosuppressive medication with your doctor. Um, and again, I would not pre-medicate with Tylenol or ibuprofen before the vaccine. Take the Tylenol after you actually start developing symptoms because it is a controlled um, inflammatory response after, after you get the vaccine. One of the other questions that we have, um, this is from Melanie, and she says her whole family has been vaccinated, but they want to know if they can gather with young people who aren't even eligible, eligible for the vaccine and therefore are not vaccinated. So that's going to be definitely a personal decision um, based on risk factors. Uh, in that scenario, if they do decide to gather, still make sure that all parties are wearing their mask because those young people who have not been vaccinated, if you decide to gather, could potentially be asymptomatic carriers. We see that young people, especially children, as well as that 18 to 29 year old age group have more often have asymptomatic or mild disease. So they might not even think that you know, it's anything. Oh, I think I just have allergies or, you know, and then they go ahead and, you know, interact with other people and they might have one of the milder infections. And it could be um, a variant that, you know, you're, um, that we have not encountered before. So I would just encourage, yes, if your whole family has been vaccinated and there are a few young people, maybe children who are not yet eligible um, to receive vaccine, if you're going to consider um, gathering, make sure that you still are wearing masks and if at all possible, do it in a safer fashion. So safer means outdoors, limiting your indoor time. So if there's the ability for you all to gather outdoors, to stay six feet apart, um, maybe to gather in a fashion where you're not necessarily sharing food, um, you know, so that you don't have your mask off um, while you're eating and talking amongst one another. Those are ways just to be a little bit safer when you do gather. I would agree with that as well. Awesome. So we have another question. This goes to, we kind of discussed this a little bit, the centralized electronic medical record database. Um, so do we have anything like that in some states? Um, and then the question is, so there are other countries that do this and yet we don't. Can we kind of talk about um, maybe, they're mentioning, um, NHS in the UK does this, they have a centralized database, but then obviously we don't really do that here. Right, so the NHS is National Health Service and Dr. Law has a bit more experience in global health than I do, but um, here everything is independently driven. So we do not have across the US, even across the, 
not even across the state, not even across the region, not even here in Houston. <laughs> we do not have a universal electronic medical record. So if you go to a certain hospital um, and then your physician is affiliated with another hospital, there's the possibility that you won't be able to see whatever happened at that hospital. So much less in terms of vaccination, you can't necessarily see across all these systems. Now there is an immunization statewide registry called MTRAC um, that is optional. So whenever you go, especially if you take your children to the doctor, there's that option of not only you signing up, but also the physician signing up and putting your um, child's immunization information into that statewide registry. There has been issues with MTRAC for many years, um, including the fact that uh, as of a couple of years ago, that when you turned 18, you had to like re-sign up as an adult to say that was my old vaccine record, carry it forth with me as an adult. So there's many issues with that. We don't have anything nationwide, much less, like I mentioned, um, statewide, that's a requirement to keep our vaccines or any of our information. And there's other um, reasons for that in terms of privacy and protection and um, protected health information. So, um, but maybe, you know, in the future, um, there will be opportunities for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big debate, this um, electronic medical record and vaccines, and especially now with world vaccinations underway. I think we're gonna see a lot of change happening in the next couple of years, um, especially with the COVID vaccine. I, I, for now, I would say that vaccine card that you get when you go, keep that in a very safe location because that is your evidence that you got it. Make sure you take it back for your second vaccine, make sure it's signed and keep it with you always. Um, if you want to travel one day abroad, I think you're definitely gonna need that with your passport. It's gonna be your ticket to travel <laughs> probably. And a lot of tech companies right now are really um, trying to get on board with this and trying to figure out a way that they can get state information and national information into like a server, let's say on our iPhone or Androids and use it as a way like let's say when you're checking into your flight that you already have that COVID vaccination status updated on your phone so that you just have to show it when you enter. Um, that's, I think, I have a feeling that's probably where things are going to head in the next year when people start traveling more as sort of a passport for travel. That's my own personal um, <laughs> belief in this. But I, I have a feeling that's probably where it's going to end up going. And well, the EHRs um, will probably be one of the tools that will help. There's a program called EPIC that's um, used around the country. And um, I think EPIC is really trying to figure out how to do this as well. And they probably will end up working with other companies to try to get this more national. I just want to make one plug for the Women's Fund and some of the wonderful publications that the Women's Fund has, which um, it's not a electronic um, uh, health record, but they do have on the Women's Fund website a free downloadable um, uh, record that you can download and keep, and it's one of the publications so that people can keep track of their health records, especially for women um, as we age, for our mothers, aunts, grandmothers, et cetera, that they can keep up with some of that information and have it in one place. We hope that electronic will be definitely the wave of the future and the way to go um, to carry forth our health records. But for now, if you can keep something at least on paper, you can make a copy of your card, laminate it, slide it in there so you can carry forth some of those health records with you. I love that. Um, and Anna just put that in the chat so everyone can can get right to it if they wanna, if they wanna download that. Um, I wanna thank you guys so much. Is We're kind of wrapping up. If you had you know, you somebody in your life who is hesitant about getting the vaccine, what would you, what would each of you say to them? Or what have you said? I know that you've probably had people that you've had these conversations with. I've yeah. had many conversations. <laughs> um, and I will say that my own mother was very hesitant um, because of some of the historical things that we talked about earlier. And just talking with her about how, you know, we've made it this far in this pandemic and you're still here and we're still here and we want you here. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is by getting our families and our loved ones vaccinated. Um, I would 
um, be devastated if there was something that happened to my family members and I had not taken the opportunity to say, this vaccine really works. It can be our ticket, you know, to maybe coming back to something that looks like more of a, what we would say, normal pre-pandemic lifestyle. Um, and so it's just my hope that all of you have access and the ability to get the vaccine here in the near future. So when you have the opportunity, when it's your time, please take that opportunity to get your shot and prevent not only your own morbidity and mortality, but for those around you and your loved ones. Yes, I completely agree. And I'm, I have a lot to say about this, but I will say that just some things that have come up over the last couple of um, weeks that people who are doing vaccinations, some of my friends are looking at, a lot of them are looking at these smallpox scars when people roll up their sleeves. And if you remember, smallpox was eradicated in 1980. And luckily we haven't seen the disfigurement of smallpox. We've been lucky. And I really hope that with this preventable illness now with a vaccine, that we'll stop seeing the results of this and seeing all the deaths and destruction that we've seen with COVID last year. And um, also uh, a recent article in JAMA actually released um, that 30% of people who have COVID will have um, long-term side effects up to nine months after they get the disease. So I know people are worried that, oh, I might have side effects or one or two days, I have to take a day off of work, but you don't wanna suffer the severe consequences of having yourself die or one of your loved ones die because you had COVID or having long-term complications that we don't even know um, what the results are gonna be. I mean, this could end up being a chronic disease. So uh, post COVID. So I think it's really important if you are given the opportunity, get vaccinated, um, take the opportunity, vaccinate and um, let others know that this is safe and effective and really try to help put a stop to this pandemic. Well, Linda, we will send it over to you. I hope Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. LaCour Chestnut and Dr. Law. What an informative presentation and discussion. We appreciate you sharing all your expertise with all of us today on this worthy, worthy topic. I know that there's been a lot of buzz and controversy out there surrounding the three approved vaccines. I will tell you, I have my appointment on Wednesday and I'm jumping up and down. Um, about that. I did put the link to how you can register for the Harris County in the chat a little earlier. It was very, very easy. And uh, I encourage everyone to do that. I'm Linda Rhodes. I'm the executive director of the Women's Fund. We're thrilled that you took a portion of your weekend to be with us today. And I'd like this opportunity to not only thank Dr. LaCour Chestnut and Dr. Law, but to thank Casey Curry. Thank you for being here. I love that you're a science geek. <laughs> um, we couldn't have done Doc Talk or any of our programming without our series sponsor, the John P. McGovern Foundation. Their support for the over 35 years has attributed to the Women's Fund many successes. Um, I wanna thank you again for attending Doc Talk. And if you have an interest in a certain topic for a future Doc Talk event, please answer the questions that are gonna pop up on your screen. We're doing a little poll uh, there. And so we encourage you to do that today. So, and we'll gather the experts and we'll have another one of these hopefully shortly. Um, if you like today's or enjoy today's program, please like us on Facebook to stay current on future events like this and our uh, monthly virtual presentations. Um, we have our month our presentations scheduled throughout the through the end of this month, and we do that uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, to see a complete list of topics and dates, visit us on our website, thewomensfund.org to register. And again, please follow us on all of our social media sites. We have Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. If you want to watch this again, we will be posting this on Facebook and on our, West, on our website. Uh, it'll probably go up on Facebook a little sooner than our website. It takes us a little while to get that up. And with that said, that concludes 
today's Doc Talk, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your beautiful weekend, and we hope to see you soon. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me.